Hi, I'm Shannon Simons and I'm the author of Safe House and I'm coming to you from my front porch today because even though I went to short stance with my kids this morning, I forgot to take the tripod and the book. So I'll send you some pictures. It's gorgeous. Um, it's a little noisy on my corner. We are about a block off the beach in kind of a busy beachy neighborhood and lots of people will be walking by chatting and being happy. We're reading Safe House. We're on chapter 12. Um, in previous chapters, Burke had assaulted Emily and ran into the woods. And then uh, while the police sat outside the house to protect her, he hid in her car and she drove him to his father's who took him to the attorney. And so that's where we're picking up. Um, Amber was in school. That's uh, Burke's stepdaughter and uh, Emily's daughter trying to be invisible. And the vice principal saw her and saw that she was kind of... He just feels like there's something off, and so he's checking it out. So that's where we're at today, chapter 12, and it's called Privilege. Burke and his father walked into the attorney Tom Potter's office. Tom stood and shook Ed's hand. Ed, Tom, you remember my son Burke. You represented him in juvenile court after a fight. I had hoped we'd never see him again, Tom said with an affectionate pat on Burke's shoulder. Have a seat, Tom pointed. Would you like some coffee? Water? Tom smelled money. Burke was a mess and looked like he'd been up all night. This was going to cost his father a pretty penny. Filling Tom in on the story, he finished with a long list of Amber's faults. Tom sat back and tried to look at him like he was thinking, but he already knew what had to be done. Burke, did your wife mention somebody from the DSAT team that came to your house with the police? Yes, the blonde lady came, but she said she didn't tell them anything. Tom knew that wasn't true. They all talked. He almost always re received discovery paperwork from the district attorney following a domestic assault, which included a signed release form and statements from the victim. He also knew that the blonde lady was Grace. He had had her on the stand before. If Burke's wife wanted out, this was just another nail in his client's coffin. Tom leaned back in his chair and rubbed his thinning hair. Wearily, he asked Burke, what did the officers look like? Burke explained. He hadn't seen much from the woods. At one point, I was up in a tree, and two officers were down below. I left for the bar in town before the dogs came. He described Officer's Heart and Iron Pot. Tom recognized the officers Burke was describing. In a small town like Nicanicum, he had faced all kinds of local officers many times in court and regularly in local restaurants and bars. Hart and Iron Pot were both good officers and not easily rattled during a trial. The evidence was probably good. He dip, scribbled on a legal pad and then without looking up, he asked, did anyone take pictures or did she go to the doctor to document her injuries? I don't know about pictures, but she went to the emergency room with that woman, Burke said. Tom shook his head and said, the woman is an expert witness in court, as is the doctor, and photos tell the whole story. All the color drained from Burke's face. So you're saying I'm going to jail? Probably not, because I'm good, Tom said, trying to sound more confident than he felt. Ed stood up, pacing the room. What do we do, Tom? He needs to turn himself in with me at his side so that we can go in front of the judge. We'll ask the judge to put your son on a release agreement that releases him to your care. The nature of the injuries, as well as possible photographic evidence included in the police body cam footage, may worry the judge, so we'll offer to put him on electronic monitoring system. You'll have to commit to keep him with you or your wife at all times. No problem. We need to talk money. I'll do what it takes, Ed offered. And then we go back to the school where Amber is waiting in the vice principal's office, and he, uh, has asked her to come in, but she doesn't know why. Amber waited her turn. Three more kids were now lined up behind her, waiting for an interview with his eminence, Mr. White. They all sat without a sound, heads down, waiting to find out how much trouble they were in. At least she wasn't the only miserable person. The secretary called their mothers. One of the little geeks started crying hard, snot running down his face. Get a real problem, Amber thought, and looked down at her shoes. Oh. We have a neighborhood traffic jam. <laughs> it's kind of a one lane street. It's a little tiny. A large shadow covered Amber's shoes. Amber, said an unusually gentle voice. A shudder ran through Amber. 
She could take anything but kindness. Feeling her hard shell shake and threatening to crack, she walked the four steps into his office. A shudder ran through her. Amber, he began again, how are you? Asking the open-ended question, he let the sentence sit heavy in the air. Squirming in her seat, she felt the oppressive weight of the loaded question. Is he just baiting me? Is this a test? It wasn't like talking with Burke, where she had learned to predict his meanness. This was like a dance with a cobra, and she wasn't sure where he was going to strike. But she was sure he would strike. They always strike. Everyone strikes. Eyes on her, he waited. Why does he just sit there, Amber thought. What could she tell him that would get him off her back? I'm getting sick, she whispered. What are your symptoms, he asked cautiously. He inched his chair back like he was afraid she was going to infect him. Sore throat, she whispered, breathing out long and hard in his direction. He visibly leaned back. Oh, well, call your mother and let's have her pick you up. I can drive myself home. Call her anyway. Okay, shuff shuffling out, she smirked into her hoodie. Picking up the receptionist's phone, she dialed nothing and then tapped the button on the phone, making the dial tone buzz in her ear. She breathed hard on the phone and coughed loudly all over it a few times. Hi, Mom, she said to no one, while wiping her nose with her free hand and then shifting and holding the receiver with, her, with the hand she just wiped her nose with. She coughed loudly all over the receiver. The receptionist's head jerked up and her eyes grew large. I'm sick, sore throat, fever. You want to talk to whom? She wants to talk to you. Amber held the phone out to the receptionist who backed away, shaking her head. I'm busy. She can't talk, Mom. I'm coming home, okay? Okay, see you then. Amber hung up the phone and lumbered weakly toward the exit. The receptionist sprayed the phone with disinfectant and was wiping it vigorously as Amber left the office. Home is worse than school right now, Amber thought. She didn't want to go home. She, she'd go to the cove, watch the surfers, and study. Amber drove through the narrow Nicanican streets across town. The view opened and on her right were the crashing waves of the West Coast's be best kept secrets. Secret, the cove. Waves, perfect for surfing, beat against large boulders and roared in her ears. Depositing long, twisted logs on the rocky inlet, tall evergreens covered the side of Tillamook Head, which jutted out to sea on the south side of the cove. Parked cars faced the rolling surf. Seagulls called and fought for scraps. The sun sprinkled light on the water. Vans were open at the back. Local tan surfers with towels wrapped tightly around their waist changed in public, slipping out of their work clothes and into wetsuits. Every other car, truck, or van had a surfboard on top of it. Amber parked her vintage Volkswagen Beetle facing the ocean, opened the windows and the sunroof, and laid, on, laid and laid on her back seat. She breathed in the salty ocean air, laid back her seat, closed her eyes and listened to seagulls call out, begging tourists to feed them. The rhythmic crashing waves seemed to pull the tension from her body. She pulled off her hood, grabbed a blanket on the back seat and covered up. The weight returned to her chest and her eyes threatened to flood over and ruin her thick black mascara. She covered her head with the blanket, rolled on her side, and began to quietly cry herself to sleep. So all you teachers and principals, you're thinking, why doesn't Amber just tell him? Why doesn't she just reach out for help? Somebody will save her, right? Well, Amber doesn't tell because believe it or not, Amber believes that A, she doesn't trust anyone. She's been trained her whole life not to trust people. She's been told not to trust people. She's been told to keep the secret. And B, Amber knows that if um, she tells again, it's gonna be worse for her mom, potentially, and that if Burke finds out she's told that it could be worse for her, for Greta, and with Burke, his habit has been to punish other people to hurt the person that he's punishing. So Amber is trained to keep that secret. And you often will see kids that um, are in domestic violence kind of just living their life, oftentimes invisible. You know, when you see a kid that's invisible and they're not um, thriving, they're not responding, it's time to do just what that principal did and ask questions, and I hope he doesn't give up. We'll see. So um, early release and privilege. Uh, you'll notice that Burke has money. Not every batterer has money, but many 
do. Um, many batterers have wealthy parents, people that can bail them out. Our judicial system, I would like to say, is always fair. Uh, I would say that in our county we have fabulous judges. We have an amazing prosecutor that works really hard to protect survivors. However, when you have money and when you can hire an attorney and when you can pay to have an electronic monitoring system, because it costs money, or you can um, know the judge, the judge could be an old friend or an acquaintance of your family, um, or your name is known like Burke's dad is, you will often have a very different outcome than somebody's low income. That kind of tends to create this picture that domestic violence only happens to low-income people because those are the cases that make the newspaper, those are the cases that make the 911 logs, but when you have money, you can hide, you can hide the case, you can sweep it under the rug. Um, I watched two very similar cases happen at the same time in the same courtroom um, with almost identical injuries. Um, the difference was in one case they had money and they went right into court with their attorney. They said, wow, I did it. I really screwed up and I need counseling and I need therapy and I need a diversion. And the judge said, hey, you go get that counseling and therapy. You do so many sessions and we will um, we'll just wipe this record right out. The other parent went in and the other parent's child had the same injuries. Um, both families, the kids had been injured during the domestic. Um, they were both serious domestics. Uh, and the child was removed from the mother as well as the father went to prison. And I don't believe that that mother ever got that child back. Um, I know that services were offered to the mother, but naturally um, she did not trust the system after that. And you can understand why. And um, a smart girl like Amber, she's watched that happen around her and she's kind of uh, checking and learning how will this affect me, how will this affect my family. So as a system, um, what that means for prosecutors or for those of you that are working with survivors is understand when they tell you that they're afraid. Understand when they tell you that they're afraid to just tell them that's why they didn't just tell. And have patience. Also, um, you need to be very careful about privilege. Uh, as, as white people, privilege. As people with money, privilege in a society and in a system that, as we can see right now, people are very angry about that privilege. And I can tell you it's very real. Um, and we can do better, and we should. So that's it.